praise you. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. We thank you for this time that we have together. I pray, Lord, that your word would come alive and help us to see a little bit more about who you are and how you operate and what you're trying to get us to grab a hold of. Let the spirit of revelation be strong. We'll be careful to give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, verse number 17 of John chapter 10. And uh, just a reminder, we mentioned at the end two weeks ago, and then we mentioned last week, that between chapter 9 and chapter 10 is kind of a transition. The first nine chapters of John, John spends most of that time trying to reveal uh, Jesus as God and in all of the glory that, that pertains to deity. Um, and how, so it was going from his humanity to his deity. And then in chapter 10, there's a little bit of a shift and he begins talking about the sheepfold and the door and all of those and how now it goes from deity to humanity and we're getting the kind of the echo uh, of revelation of who Jesus is and uh, bringing, and at the first part of John, they're bringing our humanity up to and seeing deity and in the second part of John we're now seeing how deity is interacting with humanity and uh, uh, and thankfully we're right in the blend of it so we get to see both sides of it so John chapter 17 uh, chapter 10 verse 17 says therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again no man taketh it from me but I lay it down of myself I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Now, there's a couple of things that we have to recognize in here. And again, we have to remember, we talked, well, this is back in January, probably, when we were in John chapter 1, about how God, or how Christ oftentimes talks in what we call veiled speech. Uh, and because he can't outright claim, you know, he can't come out and just say, I am God, because that's what Lucifer did. That's what Eve did. That was the, really the first original sin. And according to Philippians chapter two, he gave that up and became obedient even unto death. And so he talks in this colorful language so that people can recognize if they pay attention to what is being said. And so there's, there's some things here that we see in this passage that is so powerful. And if you are thinking right or wrong, I guess, about who Jesus is, you're going to get confused because he's saying two different things here. He's saying that my father loves me because I laid down my own life. And yet elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus is saying, I came not to do my will, but the will of the Father. So what's he doing? How is he laying his own life down if he's being sent by God to lay it down? Okay? There, it, it, there can't be two distinct deals, which lets me know that there's no distinction. It's him saying, deity loves me because I'm willing to lay my humanity on the line. And if you read John chapter 15... And I forget the scripture, the number. Let me see if I can grab it real quick. John 15. Verse number 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. No greater love. Well, the Bible says that God is love. So if there's no greater love, that means God's laying himself down for his friends. But because God is a spirit, deity is a spirit, deity can't die okay only humanity can die and so because god became flesh in john 1 14 the word became flesh and dwelt among us his flesh can die and in his flesh or in his uh manhood sonship if you will he laid down his life for you and i and so it tells us first and foremost that jesus saw his whole life as an act of obedience to god now, when you talk to somebody that believes in the Trinity, that statement will say one thing. And they'll read into it, that, and they'll use this term, that 
Jesus was obeying God. Okay, they, they don't say God the Father. They don't say the second person obeying the first person. They say Jesus obeyed God, which is correct because Jesus has, the Son has reference to his humanity. God or Spirit or Father has reference to deity. So in his humanity, he was obeying his deity. Okay, that, now that sounds kind of convoluted and hard to understand, but bring it down to your own life. The Bible says that we receive his Holy Spirit and we walk in newness of life. It's a brand new creature. We take on his name even in baptism. And so if we can do that in humanity and take on the aspects being born of God or born from above, according to John chapter 1, if we can become sons of God, children of God, doesn't that mean that part of us is deity and part of us is humanity? Because we have the spirit of God dwelling inside of us. Okay, the difference between us and Christ was all of God was in Christ. We have the earnest of our inheritance. We have just a just a little bit of his spirit. I mean, it's not all of God is resting inside of us. It's the gift of the Holy Ghost that he has given us to have a part of us. The being born of the spirit gives us the opportunity to be children of God and joint heirs with Christ. Well, how are we joint heirs with Christ? We're joint heirs with Christ because Christ references the Son. The Son is His humanity. We're humans as well. So we're joint heirs with His humanity. The difference is He has all of God inside of Him where we don't. And we still have our human flesh is a mixed human flesh. And what I mean by that is we get some genes from our father, some genes from our mother. Okay, Jesus gets genes from his father, which is deity, and his mother, which is Mary. Okay, that's the difference between us and him. And so what we get is a transformation of our, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We get uh, resurrected. We get changed. We shall not all stay the same, but we shall be changed. And we haven't even totally been changed into what we're going to be until the trumpet sounds, according to 1 Corinthians 15. And so Jesus' whole life as a man, he was setting an example for you and I. Our whole life should be an act of obedience to God. Deity had given his humanity. God had given his, his, his flesh a task to do. To wit, that God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world unto himself. That was the task of God's humanity. I, I, I say it kind of this way. How many of you have ever seen the TV show Undercover Boss? Have you ever watched that? that that's, that's kind of, I know it's a bad analogy, taking a TV show and likening it to God, but the principle is kind of, kind of similar. Okay, God created a perfect garden with perfect people in a perfect atmosphere. The perfect business, if you will. And Adam and Eve messed it up. And it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And so the CEO, if you will, God, sent all kinds of envoys to try to get people's attention. And so you see Abraham and you see Isaac and you see Jacob and you see Noah and you see David and you see all the prophets all the way down until you get to the, to, to the beginning of what we call the New Testament. And... The CEO basically says, listen, I've sent prophet, I've sent judges, I've sent kings, I have sent uh, writers, I have sent poets, I have sent example after example, and my people aren't getting any better. I'm going to go down and do it myself. But I can't go down just on my own because I would consume them because I'm pure and holy. And so I'm going to become a man. And so he fuses himself with humanity by overshadowing Mary, and Mary conceives, and the father of Jesus is deity or spirit, and the, the humanity of Jesus comes through the mother, okay? And, and so when we see all of that taking place, now as a man, Jesus is living to fulfill the task that deity wanted him to fulfill, but there's still, born, being born of a woman, Galatians says, being made under the law, 
because he has humanity in him through the genes of Mary, there is instilled in him their own, that thing that God originally created in man, which was a free will. And so as a man, Jesus had his own will. And he had to come, and so he understands when you and I struggle between our spirit man and our flesh man, he understands that battle because he had to do it. How do we know he had to do it? Well, read Luke chapter 4. He had to go out into the wilderness and three different times the, the Satan came to him and tempted him. The Bible says later in Hebrews that he was tempted at all points like as we are. But those three, he, he went out full of the Holy Ghost. He came back in the power of the Holy Ghost because he refused to do what Eve did and Adam did and Lucifer did at the very beginning. He didn't allow himself, even though it was his rightful spot, the price had not been paid yet. So he couldn't step into the role of having all power yet because he was doing the task that God designed before the world began because he knew how messed up we would become. And so his whole life was prepared to carry out this reconciliation or this restoration of the relationship between God and man. The second thing it shows us is that Jesus always saw the cross and the glory together. Here's what we sometimes find difficult to understand. But really, if you pull yourself back and take a look, if Jesus was a man, and I believe that he was, I believe Scripture teaches it, obviously, he had to make decisions in his humanity based off of what he knew in his relationship with deity. Does that make sense? He had to make decisions in his humanity based off of his relationship with deity. It's the same thing we do, by the way. If we're living for God, if we're trying to please him, all of our human decisions need to be based off of our relationship with him. Okay, here's the difference. You and I couldn't have that pure relationship with deity because the price hadn't been paid. And there hadn't been the bridge, if you will, the mediator. And so God became man to create a way so that we can rely on that. And so when, G when Jesus comes to earth and, and he looks at the cross and, and the glory, he understands from the get-go that the only way he's going to fulfill his destiny is if he goes to the cross first because the cross always predates or prefaces the glory of God. Okay? And the reason why is because before the cross, Jesus is operating in the role of a human being, in the role of a man. But after the cross, he's walking through walls. He's appearing to the two on the road. He's showing up amongst the disciples where Thomas finally looks and says, my Lord and my God. And not only that, he can still be touched. He said, reach out and touch the holes in my side and in my hands. See that I'm not who I say I am. Okay? And so Jesus sees the cross as the means of, to receive the glory or to be glorified and he doesn't do it just for him he does it for you and i and the reason why i say that and we won't get into it this week but in john 17 when jesus goes to what is really the lord's prayer the lord's prayer is three chapters long it's not just four or five verses of matthew 6 that we say is the lord's prayer the lord's prayer is how we're supposed to pray john 17 was the lord's prayer and uh but he prays in there that he does this to bring glory to us, to those that he has influence to. In other words, the prize of the glory, the price of the glory is the cross. The prize of the glory is you and I. Okay? Uh, Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He's the author and the finisher of, uh, of our faith, and, and which tells me this. He understood the only way to get us to where we're supposed to be is if he went to the cross. 
He never doubted that he must die. Never doubted. Even in the garden, when he's praying, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I think he knew he had the fortitude to know what was happening. But I think part of it is, is he wanted us to recognize that if he had to fight for it, we can fight for it. If he could make the decision to surrender his will to the will of deity, then you and I can surrender that will. We fight it, Romans 7, we fight it. But we do have the power within us if we do the right steps, if we do the right process. Well, what's the right process? Here's the right process is learning to say no to the things that we should say no to and say yes to the things that we should say yes to. Jesus received his power when he was taken out into the, the wilderness in Luke chapter 4 and the enemy comes and asks him three different questions and he responds with the word of God and basically says, no, I'm not going to fall for your offer or your challenge or your, your dictates. I'm going to just say no and I'm going to say no by using Old Testament word. And the Bible says in verse 14, I mentioned it earlier, but in verse 1 it says he went out full of the Holy Ghost. You can be full of the Holy Ghost and the devil's going to bug you. But in verse 14, it says he returned in the power of the Holy Ghost. What was the thing that transitioned from being full of to having the power of was being able to say no. Our problem is we like saying yes to the things that please our flesh when we should be saying no. And we should be saying yes to the things that please our spirit. But because the things that please our spirit usually cost our flesh something, that's the battle that we have. And here's the thing that help, would help all of us overcome that is, and, and I'm actually going to be preaching some on this on Sunday if the Lord tarries and continues the direction I'm going. But what are you looking at? What are you looking at? Jesus wasn't looking at the cross and he wasn't looking at heaven. He was looking at the people. He was looking at his flock. He's been talking about sheep. He's been talking about the sheepfold. And his eyes were on us. And because his eyes were on us, that gave him the power to say, no, not my will. His will is going to be done. If we could ever get our eyes off of ourselves, off of our own agendas, off of our own dreams, and we can get them onto somebody else and say, if it means that I've got to suffer for this person to receive from God what they need to receive, I'm going to do it. Because if our eyes are not on us, then we're open to the, to the eyes of the Spirit. Does that make sense? And, and, and so Jesus had this understanding from the very get-go that, Anything based, anything in life is based on the fact that anything that's worth anything is oftentimes hard to get. Okay? Uh, for instance, um, there's always a price to be paid. You can get a degree from some college, but you're only going to do it at the price of study. You can get a skill in any craft or any technique, but it's only going to be at the price of practice. Uh, being able to do sports are only you can only you can't just nobody can just go out and pick up a football without training does that make sense and see there's a world full of people who have missed their destiny not because they didn't know what it was not because it wasn't some awesome destiny they just didn't want to pay the price they didn't want to give up what needed to be given up they didn't want to pay what needed to be paid they didn't want to sacrifice what needed to be sacrificed you think about all of the great names that today get, you know, acclaim, if you will, but where they started and the sacrifice that they started. I saw a post on Facebook, I think, of where the four main, like Microsoft and Apple, and, and it showed their very first building. Their very first building in all of them was a beat up, run down garage. Mm -hmm. Okay, And people complain because they're so filthy rich. But the people that are complaining don't see the price that they paid at the beginning. Whether you agree with them or not, the sacrifices that they made, the risk that they took 
to get to where they're at was huge. Okay. And you transition that's in the natural world, if you will, you transition that to the spiritual world and walking with God, all, all of us miss it from time to time, but how many of us have really missed out on the unique, um, gifting that God has for us because we weren't willing to fast a little bit more, pray a little bit more, mm-hmm. take a little bit more risk and step out and talk to somebody and, and, and pay the price. Um, and, and sometimes it means, um, well, let me put it to you this way. Sometimes I get irritated with some preachers because they all they eye is that famous preacher that seems to have everything and seems to do it all, but they don't see what they the price they paid. And some of our younger preachers especially want to get the talent without paying the price. You can't get the talent without paying the price. And there's too many people that have missed out. I can only come from a preacher standpoint. But there's too many people that have missed out because they haven't taken the risk to walk down the street and talk to their neighbor about the Lord. They haven't taken the risk to pray a little bit more, to read a little bit more. You all have taken this risk to come on Thursday nights and and, and a sacrifice to come and learn more of the word of the Lord and in the long run, the Lord is going to bless and honor that. There's going to be, there already is. You can see it even when you talk and when you guys even think about some of the things that we've learned, even though you may not be able to understand all of it at the same time, but the revelation had the seed has been planted. Okay. A tree can't grow until the seed is planted. And then that seed needs to be uh, nurtured and watered and, and fertilized and watched and protected. And, and, and so all of a sudden the bud comes up and you're putting that little stake in the ground so that the trunk can get some strength. And, and you know how it is. That, that's all a fight. That's all a sacrifice. That's all a process. And Jesus understood that for him, the cross was the process to get to where he needed to be. His destiny was through the cross, not for himself, but his destiny was paying the price for you and I. Because like I said, way back at the beginning, God decided as the CEO of this thing called the world that he created, he had to come down and fix it himself. And and he came down and just like undercover boss, he got to talking to some people and the Bible says he felt everything we felt. He experienced everything. God didn't know what sleep was like until he became one of us. God didn't know what it was like to be hungry until because everything comes from him. So he didn't understand. So I, part of, and this almost sounds sacrilegious, but part of the process that God Almighty took in experiencing or expressing his love for us was taking it and experience what it meant to be a created being. He created Adam and Eve. He's never been created. He doesn't know what the difference is. He he didn't know what it was like to be a creature. He only knew what it was like to be creator. And so when creature got evil and wicked, creator got mad and said, Noah, build an ark because I'm going to let it rain. Creature didn't, or creator didn't understand creature. And so when creature got on creator's nerves, Sodom and Gomorrah burned. But notice what happens when Jesus is born and now deity, now creator understands how creature feels. How creature feels when when Jesus was just a boy. And I'm reading between the lines, but the Bible says he grew in wisdom and stature. How it feels when he stubbed his toes. And when he he hit his uh, thumb with a hammer. And when he did all the kinds of things, when he was having to clean up after the sheep, when he was having to clean up after the carpenter shop, and when he was having to do all of this, he was now experiencing for the very first time what it was like to be a creature. And so we see, we take it into theological terms and we say, you know, when Jesus came in, he was ushering in the age of grace. Well, of course, we was offering in the age of grace because grace was found because he experienced what we experienced as creatures. And so when he saw this, he's recognizing, I'm going to do something in order to make it more feasible for the creature to relate to me as creator. I'm going to let myself go to a cross. And we now have that opportunity to dwell 
with the creator of the universe as creatures. And not only that, he knows what it's like to be lacking in sleep. He knows what it's like to, to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like as a creature, not as a creator. I don't know if you've ever even thought of it that way, but when you look at this and Jesus recognizes that the cross precedes glory, the reason why the cross precedes glory is because the cross is where he experiences everything like you and I do, and the glory is when that humanity is restored to its proper place. Adam and Eve did not know what it was like to be a creature until they committed sin. When they committed their sin, they understood what it was like to be a creature and not just a perfect person, a perfect human dwelling with God in perfection. And so now Jesus comes and he says, okay, I can't reveal my glory to you yet because I haven't gotten to the cross yet. But just wait, when I get to the cross, you're going to see my glory revealed even on the cross. And so we see some things happen while he's on the cross. And we're going to talk about them uh, at the end of John here. But we see um, the, the darkness in the middle of the day. We hear about the earthquakes. We hear a Roman soldier, a centurion no less, even say, truly this man was the son of God. We see all of that happening. That's just the beginning of the revealing of the glory of God. We see the veil that was rent in twain from top to bottom. Only God could do that. Only deity could do that. It was built and designed so that nobody else could do it. And we see that happening. So as the cross is happening, glory is being ushered in. So now, fast forward a couple thousand years... When you and I come into contact with him and we find our place at Calvary, we are transitioning from creature or we are from the cross, from the sacrifice, from the price that's paid. We are automatically starting to transition into a reflection of glory. That's why before our new birth experience, we're, we are of most men most miserable. We're, we have no hope. But when we come into a born again experience or a born from above experience, what's really happening is he is taking that which is faulty, that which is that that is heavy, that which costs, that which is a sacrifice, and he's transitioning it, transitioning it in to glory. We'll see this more in chapter 17. He's moving it into the state of glory. So even now today, even though you and I are still operating in humanity, we are now reflecting the glory of God. It's the reason why the church is the epistle. The people that follow Christ are the epistle of the Lord. We are the representative of the Lord in the world because we have stepped into a position of glory. Not because of anything we did, obviously, but because of what he did for us. Does that make sense? The third thing here in your notes is that it tells us in a way that we cannot make any kind of mistake that Jesus' death was voluntary. It was voluntary. Nobody made him do it. Nobody caused him to do it. It was voluntary. Um, and, and we can see that we've talked about it several different times. He laid down his life because he chose to do so. Uh, the cross was not thrust upon him. He chose to do it. Now, somebody tell me, I'm, I'm going to take a quick break. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to cook. Yeah, Yo, my wife didn't believe us beforehand. Um, somebody tell me. Now I got to think of what my question was. Hmm. Well, I forgot. So when it comes back to me, I might ask it. So John, moving now then to, to John uh, ten nineteen. 
Therefore was a division therefore among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, He has a devil and is mad. Why hear you him? Now, <laughs> oh, these people. Uh, verse 21, let's go ahead and go to verse 21. Others said, These are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? So there's an argument that begins to take place because of what Jesus is saying and doing. And uh, they are confronted with a dilemma that all of us are confronted with. Is Jesus crazy or is Jesus real? Either Jesus was a madman or he was the son of God. He was God manifest in the flesh. One or the other. He can't be both. And there's no escape from that choice. If a man speaks about God and about himself in the way in which Jesus spoke, he's either delusional or he's the most sane and profoundly right person ever. Especially with the connotations of that day and age. And so we come to this question, how can we assure ourselves that Jesus is real, that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, and not some madman? Because there's been people besides Jesus throughout history that have claimed Messiahship. Uh, probably the most recent one, maybe not the most recent one, but the, probably the most familiar name back in the 90s was David Koresh, claimed to be Messiah. Jim Jones in the 70s as well. Um, I just saw a documentary on the whole Waco thing recently, and that's what brought him back to my mind. Um, but the people that were part of the Branch Davidians believed that David was the sent one, that he was the Messiah, and uh, David didn't, didn't negate that in any way. So how do we know that Jesus are, are, are the words of a Savior or a Messiah and not that of a madman? Well, first of all, his words are not words of a madman. Uh, witness after witness we can use to, pr to prove that Jesus uh, is supreme sanity. Thinking of men and women in every generation have judged the teaching of Jesus as the one hope. Uh, how many years has the Bible been the number one bestseller? Still is to this day. Um, and, and, and the words have given life to how many different people of different color, different ethnicity, different culture, different economic status, uh, all those kinds of things. So the words aren't the words of a madman. Number two, the deeds are not the deeds of a madman. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he comforted the sorrowful, and uh, but a madman is essentially selfish. Uh, a madman seeks nothing except for his own glory, his own prestige. But how many times we talked about it, Randy talked about it in his Sunday school lesson on Sunday. How many times did Jesus say, go and don't tell anybody? And uh, uh, mine hour is not yet come, he said in chapter 2 when he was talking to his mother Mary. And so... Um, Jesus' life was always spent not on himself, but on others. And uh, that's an example to us. Now, we live in an age today that probably more than ever, it's about what you can do for yourself. What you can get for yourself. Yeah, you may use the thing, well, it's for my family, but you're really doing it for yourself. Um what would happen though to this world if everybody began to live for somebody else what would happen if we came to church on sunday and worshiped not for what we can get from christ but what we can release christ to do in somebody else those kinds of mentality that jesus has here are the deeds of something he is the example for us of complete sanity uh, I have often said, now I love when God does something for me, and He's done so much, I couldn't even hardly start, you know. Um, but I love that. But you want to know what I get more joy out of? 
is when I'm praying for somebody and they get it. I love when God opens up his word and gives me a revelation. It's awesome. But what's even more fun is when I either teach it in here or I preach it and somebody's eyeballs get big and they say, oh, I've never seen it that way before. And, uh, and, and so just a different thought, you know, and, and uh, an example uh, real quick is in John eleven thirty five, 35, where it says Jesus wept. We're not there yet. I preached a message two, three years ago from that. And I made a statement and uh, Dave Johnson's eyes got real big in the back. He said, I've never heard it like that before. I said, because nobody's ever been able to tell me why Jesus wept. He knew he was getting ready to raise Lazarus. And I've heard people say, well, he was weeping because of their unbelief. And he was weeping because uh, he wanted to feel sorry, just like, you know, feel the empathy of losing a loved one. And uh, the Lord kind of whispered to my spirit and I preached it and it floored Dave at the time. And that was simply this. Jesus wept because he knew what he was getting ready to do to Lazarus. Lazarus was already in a good place and he's getting ready to call him back. <laughs> yes. No, that's fine. That's good. That's that's why I believe Jesus wept. Lazarus was already in a better place, and he's getting ready to prove his miracle and glory, and he's going to call him back. <laughs> yeah. I, heard, I was reading a story from thinking that Max McCain, who had already gave me that insight. Yeah. Bringing him back from the from from what's called what we would say is heaven, but his place of comfort. So his deeds were not that of a madman. And then the last thing, the effect of Jesus is not the effect of a madman. Um, it's undeniable the millions upon millions of lives that have been changed by the power of Christ. And uh, the weak have become strong, self selfish has become selfless, um, et cetera, et cetera, defeated and become victorious. It's not madness which produces that change. It's wisdom and sanity. And so the choice remains to you and I. Is Jesus crazy or is he divine? I lean towards divine. And I think uh, as close of a an inspection that we've made into scripture we can see that jesus was was a reflection of his deity through his humanity to you and i okay verses 22 to 28 it was at jerusalem the feast of the dedication and it was winter and jesus walked in the temple in solomon's porch and came then came jews round about him and said unto him how long do you make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you believe not, because you are not of my sheep, as I say unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, we get the date and the time and the place for this conversation from John. And I don't believe that it's accidental. Um, it's the Feast of De Dedication or the Festival of Dedication. Now, the Jewish culture loves feasts uh, more than the Pentecostals do. They love to eat. They love to party. They love to have a good time. And this Festival of Dedication has a couple different names. Um, it's sometimes called the Festival of Lights, and the Jewish name for it is, can anybody guess? Hanukkah. Hanukkah. It's Hanukkah, uh, which is the 25th of the Jewish month called Chislu, which is correspondent to our month of December. That's why Hanukkah and Christmas always fall close 
within days of each other. And the origin of Hanukkah or the festival of dedication lies in really one of the great times of heroism in Jewish history. Uh, there was a king of Syria named Antiochus Epiphanes. He reigned from 175 to 164 BC. And he was a lover of all things Greek. It's part of the reason why we have so much Greek in the New Testament, because he infused Greek everywhere he reigned. He, he, he decided that he would ultimately eliminate Jewish religion once and for all and introduce only Greek thoughts and concepts. And I will tell you, this is an aside and it's what I believe, part of the discussions, controversies throughout history has been because the, the Greek philosophy that Antiochus Epiphany initiated into the culture carried over and that's like if you study the council of nicaea in 325 really what they're battling is they're trying to fit the christian biblical doctrine into a greek mindset greek mindset of many gods and that's where we get the pluralism and the dualism and the trinitarianism and the triunism and all of the different philosophies about who god was because the Greek culture and the Roman culture, but the Greek culture especially had all kinds of gods. And uh, so that's what Antiochus was trying to do. And he, at first he tried to do it with peaceful passing of ideas or teaching, if you will. And some Jews welcomed the new ways and some didn't. Uh, but it was in about 170 that the deluge really came. In that year, the Bible, well, not the Bible, but history tells us that Antiochus uh, attacked Jerusalem. And it was said that 80,000 Jews perished in this siege or this attack, and as many were sold into slavery. There was 1,800 talents, which according to today's, about $600 million worth of stuff was stolen from the temple treasury, gold and trinkets and all of the different things. And it became a capital offense to possess a copy of the law or to circumcise a child. In fact, a, a mother who did decide to circumcise their children were crucified with their children hanging around their necks. The temple courts were profaned. Uh, the temple chambers were turned into brothels. And finally, Antiochus uh, Epiphanes took the dreadful step of turning the altar of sacrifice and burnt offering into an altar to uh, the Olympian Zeus. And on it proceeded to offer swine, which obviously, if you know anything about Jewish culture, was unclean. And it was then that a man that you may have heard of, I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, of Judas Maccabeus. And if, if you haven't rented or seen or located the movie Masada, um, it's based off of this whole time frame. And so in 164, the struggle was finally won. And it was in that year that the temple was cleansed and set back up and purified. The altars were rebuilt. The robes, the utensils were replaced after three years of pollution. And it was, they initiated this festival or the purification or this feast of dedication was instituted at that point. And Judas Maccabeus enacted, and, and this is a quote from his book, it says, The days of the dedication of the altar should be kept in their season from year to year by the space of eight days from the five and twentieth day of the month of Chislu with gladness and joy. And so that's the reason that the festival that's called the festival of dedication, the festival of lights, sometimes the festival of, uh, of memorial and purification, or what we most often hear today is Hanukkah, uh, that that this is the birth of it, and uh, and so the whole concept of the the menorah and the lighting of the candles, all that was part of that. That's why one of the callings of this feast was the feast of lights, and uh, 
the lights, it's why there's eight uh, candles and they're, they light one each day until they're all lit. <clears throat> um, and it comes from, there, there's, a, there's a history or a belief that a miracle took place that when they got back to the temple, that when they went to, to uh, relight the, the lights, the candlestick, <clears throat> that the, the cruise oil that keeps them burning were all destroyed except for one. And usually that's enough to light all the candles for one day. And miraculously, they, their, their history says, miraculously, God let that burn all week long until they had the replacements. And um, so it's, it's the, the freedom of light, or the festival of lights. And so it's, it, it's a huge festival that he's having this. Um, I also think that the reason why John is is saying this is we have to remember what did John say in chapter 1 anybody remember okay he said that but what about about verse 4 no the light of men he, he declares himself to be like remember John chapter 1 is the thesis statement for everything John writes so he's been talking about God becoming flesh and now he's taking in this passage I don't think it's an accident that he uses this festival or this feast because it's about light and again he's revealing in another way who Jesus is and then it, it's found in, in Solomon's porch which was simply if you walked into the court of the Gentiles in the tabernacle or the temple, along the sides there was two porches. One was called the royal porch, one was called Solomon's porch, and people would walk up there and they would pray, and rabbis would take their, the, their followers up and begin to teach and discuss, and it was away from the ritual of the temple where, where the altars were, and it was off to the sides and up higher, so it was uh, out of the way, if you will. And here is Jesus up there talking, and the Jews come to him and they ask him, are you going to tell us today? <laughs> when are you going to tell us whether or not you really are who we think you are, we're starting to think that you are? Now there was probably two different people asking that question. One genuine, genuinely wanted to know, are you really the Messiah? Are you the Christ? But then there were others that were posing this question as a trap to catch him in blasphemy uh, which was the thing that they could then take and put him to death if you will get rid of him once and for all and uh, I, I find it interesting how Jesus responds he said I've told you already but you didn't believe me well he never really told them with words we have the record of him telling the Samaritan woman in private and the man that he healed in John 9 in private, but he hasn't really publicly out and out stated it, but what has stated it was his deeds, what he did. And there are claims to which words are not needed, um, especially to an audience that should recognize it. Okay? An audience that should be able to perceive them. And so... The first was his deeds, the second was his words. But these people, these Jews, knew Old Testament scripture. Isaiah said it this way, Then the eyes of the blind, about when the Messiah would be here, the eyes of the blind would be open, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing for joy. Well, that was every one of Jesus' miracles. Plain as day. So if these people that understood the prophets were grasping, the problem was it went against their sense of control and their sense of importance and their egotistical outlook on things. And in their minds, they're protecting their religion and they're missing the concept of a relationship. If they would have just read that, I mean, even the wise men, when they came and worshipped the, the child, were not Jewish of descent, but they had read enough of Scripture to understand what was going You could read the sign. They couldn't even read the plain words. that. And we know also that they knew Isaiah. They knew the prophet because when Jesus 
opens the scroll in the temple, he reads from Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He reads from that, and then he closes the scroll. So they knew, or they should have known, what the prophet had said, and he basically described him. The second were his words, and Moses had said that God would raise up the, the prophet that must be listened to in Deuteronomy 18. And so there was a great majority of the Jews that had not accepted him. And then there were some that accepted him for the moment because they were excited and hopeful. But at the same time, they had fallen into the understanding, the wrong understanding of how things were going to play out. Um, because they had heard for so long that Israel would be resurrected and, and the Messiah would be the one riding on a horse. They missed the time from when he was born to when he does come back riding on a horse to kick off the millennial and he rules and reigns from the throne of David. Um, and, and what John is, because this passage is tied in John chapter 10, it lets me know, and Jesus says, you don't believe because you're not of my sheep. Okay, so you have to remember back to the first part of 10. We criticize some people for not hearing or seeing or understanding, but it's because they haven't learned to recognize the shepherd's voice. Does that mean that they're you know, condemned to be lost? No. I, I believe that many of the people that were here ended up being in Acts 2. You know, I, I just have to believe that. But here's my thing that we have to understand is and I've noticed it I noticed it a lot and I preached about it some when COVID really hit and we start, had at the beginning of the COVID stuff and the beginning of the lockdowns and the shutdowns and all of that um, all of the people that were out on social media saying okay the end is here get ready the rapture's coming this is the sign of the beast this is well a lot of that is because people have got a preconceived idea of how all this is going to play out. And I've said it before, it's one of the reasons why I don't spend a lot of time teaching the book of Revelation, because there's multiple interpretations for the book of Revelation. And I believe that that's on purpose, because I don't think Jesus wants to know, wants us to know when he's coming back. And, and so as a Christian... We need to do what the disciples and the followers of Christ in this time did. Oh, he's not coming like the warrior that we've been taught he's going to come. This is something totally different. But all the signs point that he's right and that he's real. And so I'm going to go with the flow. Do I believe that Jesus is coming soon? I've believed it my whole life. But you have to identify the word soon. Is soon 80 years, 100 years, 1,000 years? Jesus told the disciples upon this uh, generation, the Son of Man will return. Well, there's been pictures of that generation throughout time, and he hasn't come back. So do you see what I'm saying? We get so caught up in how we think it's going to play out. And so when things start happening in the world, we try to start plugging the quote-unquote prophecy into what's happening. And it, it, it ends up frustrating people because you end up politicizing the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is not a political kingdom. Okay? And we often forget, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again, Jesus is not an American. I know we don't like to think that or believe that, but he's not an American. And, uh, and, and I believe that Jesus is probably a blend of capitalist and a blend of socialist. Because he says, as often as you fed the poor and fed, and clothed the, or fed the hungry, clothed the poor, you've, you've done it unto me. But then he also has given people the talents to go and make the money themselves, and he blasted the one that didn't make it. So there's a blend there. So we can't claim some things that we have tried to claim in the world that Jesus is because his kingdom is a whole lot bigger. But we've become so narrow-minded in certain things that we've done 
and uh, and the way things should play out. And uh, the new thing I saw out on Facebook or whatever uh, this last week was a big post. Where is America in biblical prophecy? And there's really no answer. I mean, there's answers, but I can disprove the answers as much as I can prove them. Yeah. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is we can't afford to miss him because we think it's going to happen a certain way. It's why with what's going on at our church right now is something really, really big. And I think part of the reason why we can't put a finger on it yet is because our minds can't wrap around how big it's going to be. And for two reasons. Number one, we'd probably freak out because there's probably going to be some sacrifice involved. There's going to probably be some questions on how we're going to be able to do this. The, the, the second thing is, is God doesn't want us spending on our, our time figuring out how we're going to accomplish what he's wanting to do. He's wanting us to spend our time on preparing ourselves as instruments for him to do what he's going to do. And so he's not going to reveal it. You know, so for instance, let me just give you an example, and this is not because God has said it, but if God came right now and said, all right, by December 1st, you're going to have 2,000 people in your church. Okay, number one, I'm going to say how <laughs> in the world. And it's gonna, that's, that's enormous. And number two, okay, I'm going to spend the next five months trying to figure out how we're going to get a thousand people in a church. And neither one of those are what God wants from us. God doesn't want me worried about, and you worried about how he's going to reach a thousand and what building it's going to house it and all of how that's going to cost and how that's going to play it out. That's just stuff that we don't have to worry about. We have to worry about hearing his voice and following him. That's what these Jews were doing. They missed out because they had this preconceived idea of what was supposed to happen and when it didn't happen and there again and I've said it several times in this class but we criticize those that missed him but how often have we done the same it just hasn't been written down in history about us <laughs> but those that did follow him and accept him there's three things that jesus promised here in verse 28 he says he promises them eternal life okay this is it's kind of funny because it sounds like it's um redundant here he says i'm going to give them eternal life that they never perish and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand um eternal life there is coming a day when the trump of God sounds and that which is mortal shall become immortal, that which is corruptible shall become incorruptible, 1 Corinthians 15. That's our eternal body. That is our glorification process. But by being a follower of Christ now, we have that in seed form, if you will, for lack of a better term. We have our inheritance of that we're already living our eternal life it's just that we're living our eternal life with a physical body okay a non-glorified body and what i mean by that is this just because we're human doesn't mean that god operates simply in human form right now um and the reason why i say that is because when you and I are in tune with him, he does things on a spiritual level that he could not do in the Old Testament with people. There's very few people. I shouldn't say he couldn't do it. But because the price hadn't been paid, the mediator hadn't been put in place, the relationship had to be done through the law and through rituals and through form and, 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 and pomp and circumstance type things. Now you and I have that relationship with him. We can dwell in heavenly places with him right now, even though we haven't had a glorified body, which was eternal. Okay, So that's why I say we have eternal life right now. We're operating. It's the reason why, we, the, why the Bible says that we should walk by faith and not by sight. 
Faith is simply spiritual eyesight, for lack of a better term. I know we quote Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let, let me boil that to Tim phrase, okay? Faith is seeing with non-physical eyes what God is doing. Okay, I, I can see by faith what God is doing. So my faith tells me everything's going to work out. Whatever God has for us, it's going to work out if we'll listen and follow and obey. I can't see it physically. I don't know what it is physically, but my faith is already there. Okay? And, and so we have to understand that we're operating on an eternal level right now. It's operational by faith, but we're going to see it very clearly physically when we have our glorified bodies and we walk into heaven. First John 3, 2 says we're going to be like him for we shall see him as he is. That's physical sight. We're going to be able to see him. We're going to see the man that walked on water. We're going to see the man that hung on the cross. We're going to see the man that was raised from the tomb. We're going to look at him just like the disciples did of old, but we're going to be in, the, in his presence forever with him. But in the meantime, we get some of that kingdom down here. We sing the song, you didn't want heaven without us, so you brought a little heaven down here, something to that effect. That, that's really what being eternal is all about. And so he promised eternal life. Then he promised a life that would know no end. I, I look at that, or that should not perish, is the King James Version. I look at that in not so much terms of eternality uh, or being eternal. I look at that in, as in this. If the Lord tarries and we pass from this earth, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. Okay? It's the beginning of our true life. Remember, we're operating on the earnest of our inheritance. We're operating on seed faith. We're operating on faith. We're on, operating on the seeds of eternity. But the moment that we take our last breath on this earth, it doesn't mean we die. It means we are really resurrected. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. Okay, that's where life is, is with Christ. Do you get what I'm saying? Do you see the difference between being the promise of being eternal and the promise of not dying? Do you, do you get the difference that I get there? Uh, and then the third one, he pr uh, promised a life that was secure. Nothing could snatch them from his hand. Now this doesn't mean that they wouldn't face things. In this world you'll have trials and tribulations, but I've overcome the world. But what this means is that in the midst of everything that comes crashing down around us, we can be confident of who is holding us. Okay? He's got the whole world in his hands. And so, like right now, we're in the middle of a drought. He's got the whole world in his hands. Okay? Okay? When we're complaining because we're in a season of flooding, he's got the whole world in his hands. When we got six feet of snow on the ground, he's got the whole world in his hands. Uh, those are the promises that he's given us as followers. Not that we don't have to go through all of those, but that if we stay with him, if we, if we follow him, if we are one of his sheep and listen to his voice, nothing can take us away from him. Now notice, now there's some... Uh, philosophies out there that the concept of once saved always saved and they'll use this scripture see he can't you know once you're a follower you can't be plucked out of his hand that, that's not what it says if you read the whole chapter it says if you're a sheep that listens to his voice and knows his voice and obeys his voice then nothing can pluck you out of his hand there's a whole difference uh there um I want to finish up chapter 10. The last eight or nine verses um, are kind of connected to basically verse 29 to 38 or 39 are all kind of the same, are all connected. And so I'm going to kind of paraphrase through some of this. Um, 
and, and it's kind of going to be somewhat of a refresher from last week. But verse 29, My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Okay, I want you to look at those three verses and tell me, based off of what we talked about last week and what we've talked about in John chapter 1 about, about God becoming flesh, why does the statements in verse 29 and 30 without breaking it down, say that Jesus is basically God manifest in the flesh. Does anybody see it? I and my Father are one. Okay. <clears throat> why, is that, why does that speak to that and not... A Trinitarian will say, well, yeah, they're one God, but they're two persons. And they're, they're, they're one in union or one in unity. There, there's the, the reason why I'm asking is, is there's a reason here that goes beyond the. Sure. Verse 30. I and the Father are one, in essence and in purpose. We don't give a clear claim to be a human man. Remember, our Creator is one God and three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ is one person with two natures, divine and human. Yep. And that's. That's coming from a Trinitarian background. Yes, it is. My thing with this, there, there's, there's, I'll just tell you just to save time. There's a couple things that stick out to me that let me know that this isn't a Trinitarian passage. Number one, it says, I and my Father are one. It doesn't say, I and my Father and the Holy Ghost are one. It just says, I and my Father. Well, what about the Holy Ghost? If it's three persons, how come he's not referenced in this? Okay, he's not. Okay. The second thing is, is what do you notice in verse 30 that shouldn't be there? I'm pulling out all the teaching that we've had. It's a two-letter word. Nope. I and what's what is how is my in the scripture there? What version are you reading? Do you mean italicized? Yeah. Yeah, not capitalized. Yeah, yeah. Italicized. italicized. What is an italicized word in the King James version? Added. It's added by translators. You take that out and you put the proper article. Now I'm really getting into English and I'm not good at it. The proper article is the word the, not my. I and the Father are one. See, when it's italicized with the my there, it sounds like that son-father relationship. But Jesus is saying, I and the Father are one. We're the same thing. It's his way of saying I'm God without saying I'm God. Yeah. I and my deity, or I and deity, yeah. I and originator are one. And then the second thing that I notice is uh, in verse 31. What is the response of the Jews? They want to stone him. Why do you think they want to stone him? Because he just said he was God. He just blasphemed in their eyes. They read the statement that he said, as I'm God. Not, not, it's not a union. It's not a committee. Jesus is declaring, I am the creator manifest in flesh. He just did not use those terms because he's still speaking in veiled speech. But even the Jews that missed him completely as the Messiah recognized that those were blasphemous words according to the law. And that word one, a lot of people will say that means unity. That word one has to do with union. Union and unity are two different things. Union is the coming together. 
father and mother, or a, a man shall leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh, a union. And what God has put together, let no man put, us, uh, put asunder. You can't tear it apart. It's one and the same. So when Jesus looks at a married couple, he's seeing one person. Now, I know that there's two people involved, but there's, they've become one. They've, they've, it's a picture of what God did. I can't explain the incarnation when deity became humanity, but I can look at this and say they became one in union. His humanity and his deity became a union in this boy named Jesus Christ. Or Jesus, son of Joseph, actually. Okay, And it was so plain as day when he says this that the Jews start picking up stones to cast at him and stone him because they are bla he is blaspheming what God had originally said because even in the New Testament they were still quoting every day Deuteronomy chapter 6. When you're sitting in the way, when you're walk or sitting in the or laying in your bed, sitting in your home, walking by the way, uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind. And, and, and so, I and my Father, or I and the Father, are one, is basically taking the Shema and saying Jesus is saying I am fulfilling the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is. I'm one. I'm Him. So I don't even have to try to figure out what Jesus is trying to say. I can, I can see the reaction of the Jews of that day saying, Oh, you're telling me that the God that created everything is you? You're a carpenter's son. And so, but what ends up happening, Jesus says, Many good works have I showed you from my Father, or from deity, if you will, for which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. I didn't even have to teach as to how it broke down and explain it. The Jews recognized that Jesus was declaring who he was plainly and what they didn't want to what they didn't want to understand is that 10 verses earlier they were wanting him to make it plain when are you going to when are you going to make us how long dost thou make us to doubt if you're the Christ tell us plain i told you already who i am and it comes down to say i'm god and then now that they plainly said it i'm going to stone you not because of the works you did but because you declare who you are I'm like make up your mind and so Jesus answers them, Is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. Now, you brought this up last week. And this was a... And I'll explain it here in just a minute. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent unto the world, talking about me. Thou blasphemest, because I said I'm the Son of God. In the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, there is a, a passage that declares that God sets up uh, gods. And that word, lowercase, but it's, it's word, and, and in some cases it's, it says judges, I believe. I'm not even sure what this, this version says. It's Psalm 82, 6. Psalm 82, 6. It says this, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Okay? It's a psalm of Asaph. Okay? And so Jesus is, is quoting from that. It's written in your law. I said, you are gods. Now, it's interesting that that word gods in Psalm 82.6 is the word Elohim. Now, a Trinitarian will try to tell you that the word Elohim is the proper name of God. But the word Elohim can mean multiple gods or judges. And he even says in the psalm, All you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge of the earth. Okay? So he's, he's basically equating the judges or the leaders of that day as Elohim, as gods. Okay? So he says this, If, if they were called gods in Scripture, why are you 
putting me to death or stoning me to death because I've just quoted basically what was said about them in Old Testament scripture. I just took that and said it about me. And more than them, I've been sent by the Father. I've sanctified. I've been sent into the world. And then in verse 37, he says, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do... Though you believe not me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So in other words, he's, that he's now saying to them, listen, I've, I've, I'm fulfilling your Old Testament scripture here. You don't have grounds to stone me on blasphemy because I'm doing exactly what Asaph did in the book of Psalms and in the earlier in the law. And so then he goes on to challenge them. And the same challenge is here today. Okay. If you believe me, not from what I say, believe in the works that I'm, okay? So in other words, think about it. Who do you pray to? Jesus. Okay. Who do you fast to? Who do you worship? Who do you fall in love with, spiritually speaking? Who are you? Who has changed your life the most? Who has transformed you? Who has translated you? Who has blessed you? Who has healed you? Okay? You can't differentiate whether or not it was the Son or the Father because it's all the same being. Okay, you can't say who saved you and who didn't save you because there's scriptures throughout that says it's God that saves and it's Christ that saves. It's the ones that heal. So even here in this passage, Jesus or John brings it right down to our day. Listen, you may, you want to believe in, in the right God? Look at the works in your life. Look at the works that he's done. It's one of the reasons why I believe that Paul wrote in Romans 1, that they're without an excuse if you look at nature. They're without an excuse that there's a God. And just before that, he, he says in verse 16, that's I think verse 18 when it says there's without excuse. In verse 18, he says, I'm not ashamed of the power or of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It's the impetus. His humanity is the impetus to get us to deity. And so then notice verse 39. They sought again to take him. Again, a response that he's plainly declaring himself in the eyes of these people to be the God that they serve. And that's a blasphemous statement. But he escapes out of their hand and he goes away and, and, uh, and then we, we get to chapter 11. Praise God. See, I knew I'd get it done. But do you understand that the, the reason why Jesus had to talk the way he did? He had to do that. He still had to talk in veiled language because of the original sin of Lucifer and, and Eve. And I get that. Where I get that from is primarily from Philippians chapter 2. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and became in the form of a servant, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What is so reassuring to me or what is such a blessing to me and will continue on is I'm standing in awe of Jesus Christ as God man of the fest of the flesh in chapters 1 through 9 and all the miracles he did. But now in chapter 10, it turns around and I'm amazed that the great God of glory saw fit to make me one of his sheep and manifest himself in the man Christ Jesus so that I would have a shepherd to lean on. And that, that blows my mind that God operates that way. Praise God. Is there any questions before we wrap things up?